you know, the under-realization of human potential represented by these achievement gaps uh, is really profound, and it is the equivalent of a permanent national recession. And importantly, it has a profound impact, not just on the overall economy, but on individuals as well. Measuring the economic impact of the achievement gaps is necessarily imperfect, but we believe it is important to place these achievement gaps into a broader context, to put a number on it, to be able to rank it among our national priorities. To size the economic impact of the achievement gap, we asked, what if, in the 15 years following a nation at risk, so it was published in 1983, 15 years following nation at risk, what if? What if we were able to bring our schools up to the top international standards? What if we were be able to have our students perform like students in Korea or Finland? What if we were able to, in those 15 years, close the racial achievement gap? What if we were able to close the income gap? And what if we were able to take the bottom half of school systems and bring students in those systems up to the national average? What if? What would the world look like in 2008 if we had fixed those problems by 1998? What would, how would the economy look different? The results are striking. If the U.S. had closed the international achievement gap, U.S. GDP would have been $1.3 to $2.3 trillion higher in 2008. Now, this is necessarily imprecise, um, but we are confident in the orders of magnitude here that these are right. This is a massive drag on the overall economy. If you look at the racial gap, if we were able to improve black and Latino student performance, if we were able to bring them up to the level of white student performance, in 15 years, from 83 to 98, if we were able to bring them up, the economy in 2008 would have been 525, up to $525 billion larger. If we had lifted the scores of students with family incomes less than $25,000 a year to the level of students with family incomes more than $25,000 a year, the impact would have been $400 billion to $670 billion. And if we had increased the scores of students in states below the national average to the national average, U.S. GDP would have been 425 to 710 billion dollars larger. These are big numbers. But we thought it would be useful to put this under-realization of human potential in the context of the under-realization of economic potential represented by uh, the largest, the three largest post-war recessions. So as you can see, uh, the recessions in the 70s, 1973 to 1975, uh, GDP, the economy shrank 3.1%. 1981-82, 2.7%. And then GDP declined by a little more than 6% in the fourth quarter of 2008. These are measures by how much the economy underperformed its potential. Now look, let's look and see how the achievement gap how that translates and how much the economy is underperforming its potential due to the underrealization of the potential that are in these students. The racial achievement gap was larger than any of the post-war recessions as an economic impact equivalent or greater to that of any of the post-war recessions up to the current recession. It's a similar story for the income-based gap and for the system-based gap. And the impact of the international gap is significantly larger. It is a drag of between 9 and 16 percent current GDP, which is significantly larger than even the current recession. And that means that this achievement gap and these achievement gaps have a profound impact on the overall economy. As Byron stated earlier, this is not simply an issue about poor kids in poor schools. This is an issue about most kids in most schools. But it's important to recognize that this isn't just an economic impact. These achievement gaps have very compelling uh, and important impacts on individual kids as well. Let's take two students in the fourth grade. Both of those students perform in the bottom quartile of the fourth grade standardized test. Most kids who are behind in fourth grade are behind in eighth grade. And folks in the bottom quartile in eighth grade generally enter the workforce with lower paying jobs, lower skilled jobs. If, however, that student in fourth grade was able to move up to the top quartile by eighth grade and then enter the economy, We've seen that that difference is equivalent of 40%, the 40% higher median income. 
So the kid who moved to the top quartile enters the workforce more prepared to work and commands a 40% premium on average to those who remained underperforming. Now, not a lot of kids move from the bottom to the top, even in very good school systems. Uh, the numbers are strikingly small. But we have seen it happen, uh, and it is possible. But let's talk for a minute about the other implications of the folks who do stay at the bottom. It's not just about earnings. It's also about incarceration rates. It's been well documented that high school dropouts have a much higher incarceration rate than folks who graduate high school and folks who go into college. Uh, folks who are less well educated have higher instances of smoking and obesity and are much less likely to vote. Uh, these are real problems that affect individuals. This isn't just about the economy, it's also about individuals. While the outlook here may seem grim, any fair view of the facts shows that it doesn't have to be this way. It is possible to do better, and there are pockets in the United States where people are doing better. For example, while there may be real differences in the starting points for poor kids, for black and Latino kids, we've seen that different school systems have different results with basically the same kids. I'd like to walk you through two examples. This is the fourth grade NAEP math test. Among low-income black kids, low-income black kids at Texas are two years of learning ahead of low-income black kids in D.C. by the fourth grade. Two years ahead with the same students by fourth grade. If you look at low-income white students, low-income white students in Massachusetts are a year and a half ahead of low-income students in Alabama. And let's for a second compare the Alabama low-income white score to the Texas low-income black score. This isn't necessarily about race. Race and income do not need to be destiny. We've seen that different school systems have been able to make real differences with the same kids. There's another reason for optimism as well. School systems themselves have been able to improve. As outlined in the Century Foundation's recent report, New Jersey has made significant progress in closing of the achievement gap. As many of you know, as a result of the Abbott lawsuits, the New Jersey Supreme Court has become heavily involved in the state of New Jersey in closing the achievement gaps. And while not all districts in New Jersey have had similar levels of success, as a state on the whole, New Jersey has made the most progress of all US states in closing the achievement gap over the past 15 years, and uh, have dropped that gap by 16 points, or a year and a half of learning. They've closed that gap uh, significantly. And during this time, one district in New Jersey that's highlighted in the Century Foundation's report, one district, Union City, New Jersey, which is a poor, primarily Latino district, has essentially completely closed the achievement gap. The facts show that it is possible to make progress here, uh, and that the lessons from these success stories could be investigated and could potentially be lessons for the broader school system.